Welcome to the Apocalypse. This is Comic Book Apocalypse, the graphic world of Jack Kirby. We are here in the Cal State Northridge Art Galleries, specifically in the main gallery, surrounded by more than 100 pieces of art uh, by the great Jack Kirby. In this 3,000 square foot space, with the roughly 300 linear wall feet, we have 107 originals by Jack Kirby. We have six G clays. We have two interactive iPad displays provided by the Jack Kirby Museum and Research Center designed by Tom Kraft. Uh, we have 52 vintage comic books. We have four um, snapshots of Jack at work taken by David Folkman in the 1970s. Uh, we have a number of other uh, artifacts or effects representing Jack Kirby, his extraordinary work, uh, and his storied career uh, in comic books. What we're trying to provide here is both a window into the last half of Jack Kirby's career, a career much too grand to fit into one space, even a space this large, and at the same time a window onto the entire history of the American comic book. Uh, I'm Charles Hatfield. I curated this show, uh, and I've been working with the gallery director here, Jim Sweeters, for the better part of three years to bring all of this work together. Uh, Jim and I began conversing about a comic book show five years ago, uh, and the idea for this particular show really came together again about three years ago in the wake of my book on Kirby, sorry, self-promotional horn tooting time, Hand of Fire, The Comic Art of Jack Kirby, which was published late in 2011, or on the cusp of 2012, and it was at that point that my conversations with the gallery director really went from let's do a comic book show to let's do a Jack Kirby show. This is the first show in the Cal State Northridge main gallery to focus on original comic art. It's not the first comics exhibit here at CSUN, but it's the first one in this, the largest of our gallery spaces, and it's the first one devoted to originals. So naturally, we thought we'd aim high or start big, so we decided to, <laughs> to bite off something challenging, which is to bring in the sought-after work of the great Jack Kirby. This show concentrates on Kirby's work from about 1965 onwards, although it includes samplings of his earlier work as well, so that we can really give our visiting public a sense of uh, the scope and grandeur of Kirby's career even prior to 1960. Our earliest piece is from 1943. Uh, our latest piece is from 1985. Uh, of those 107 originals, um, I think 100 of them are some kind of comic book production art. There's a very few other pieces, uh, unpublished penciled pieces and a wonderful painting uh, by Kirby. Uh, but 100 pieces here are comic book production art. They are panel pages or spreads or splashes or covers uh, for comic books. Um, again, primarily from the 60s, 70s, and early 1980s. One of the things that we're really proud of here is the fact that we have five of the signature collages that Jack Kirby uh, was uh, so involved in, so invested in making. Um, of these five collages, um, four of them were comic book production art. Um, this piece over here to my left uh, is an unpublished piece, uh, one among many, uh, that Jack Kirby created at home for his own personal satisfaction from a morgue file of clippings that, uh, that apparently he had because, you know, he wasn't busy enough creating three or four or five or more complete comic book stories from scratch every month. He was also making art and thinking about combining old things to make new things. I think a metaphor for all of his creative process, in fact. So we have five collages here, um, including the Hunger Dogs collage, Kirby's um, final published collage during his lifetime from the climax of his Hunger Dogs graphic novel in 1985. Uh, so we're pleased to be able to have this aspect of Kirby's creativity, something uh, not well represented in exhibitions of Jack's work to date. We have a number of different clusters here in the show that are designed to represent different uh, phases or aspects of Jack Kirby's creativity. Uh, this is what I call the fourth world wall, which begins with the opening splash of uh, the New Gods, number one, from 1970, and proceeds through a number of examples of the New Gods and its sister titles, Mr. Miracle, The Forever People, uh, and behind me, Jimmy Olsen. Uh, so we've tried to represent 
that um, extraordinary project, the fourth world, in many ways the apex of, of Kirby's ambition and, and, uh, in, in the comic book world. So the fourth world is represented here uh, and punctuated by this marvelous mural created by Jeff Grogan. Uh, Jeff is the cartoonist behind the comic strip series uh, Jetpack Jr. and he's also uh, a teacher at Adelphi University in Long Island. Uh, and Jeff uh, provided us the design for this fourth world themed mural, a father and son mural with uh, the emblematic dark side on the upper right and Orion below. Um, so the design for this did come from Jeff Grogan uh, and the final production um, work was uh, accomplished by Louis Solis, who is an in-house designer and teacher here at Cal State Northridge. Once we had this image, we knew that this had to be the fourth world wall because we wanted this image out front in a big screaming attention getting way uh, right here in the main part of the gallery. Uh, and once we had that, we knew that these signature characters had to be featured in originals nearby. Uh, and that led to some other design choices as well. So for example, in this vitrine or case, which is roughly four by eight feet, um, we made a decision early on to represent the latter part of Jack's career, including those things that are especially featured in the exhibition. And so we have a number of the Fourth World publications here, uh, iconic titles and covers by Kirby, which we hope will speak to what is on the wall opposite, uh, so that people, if they are really digging in and paying close attention, will see the published comic book form of the work here and then see the originals over on the other side. Behind me is the Fantastic Four wall uh, representing late 60s work uh, by Jack Kirby inked by Joe Sinnott. We have a number of pages from uh, late examples of their collaboration on the Fantastic Four series uh, and we wanted to make sure to bring that out front as well because the Fantastic Four was really a flagship or benchmark comic for Marvel and for Kirby in the 1960s and one of his longest sustained runs on any project. Plus, as we know, the Fantastic Four is a wellspring of so many other concepts and characters that have gone on to headline comics of their own. Hence the pages representing the Black Panther and the Silver Surfer here uh, in this corner. These are later pages from the 1970s uh, adjacent to the 1960s uh, Fantastic Four work. Uh, we're really trying to catch uh, Kirby's late 60s Marvel's work at its, at its apogee and at that point of transition to his early 1970s work uh, for DC. So we have Fantastic Four sort of bleeding into the fourth world wall over here um, so that people can see those two distinct phases of Kirby, one perhaps a sequel uh, to the other. We've also tried to showcase various inkers or embellishers, artistic partners and collaborators that Jack Kirby worked with. We want to make sure that those other hands, those other artists who were bringing their talents uh, to these pages are uh, duly noted, uh, properly documented. And so the opportunity to show vintage work inked by Joe Sinnott um, or other work inked by, for example, Mike Royer, as we'll see on other walls, uh, was really important to me. We wanted to make sure uh, that uh, as much as we're celebrating the individual genius of Jack Kirby, that the, the processes behind the makings of these comics and the collaborations uh, were well represented. We have a photo here by David Folkman of Joe Sinnott, uh, Jack Kirby, and The Thing uh, from the uh, New York City Comic Con in 1975, uh, representing that historic partnership. Moving in this direction, uh, we have the uh, climactic splash page from Silver Surfer number 18, uh, drawn by Kirby in 1970, inked by the late Herb Trimpey, and that image has become the branding image for the show uh, with the enormous mural uh, produced by Louis Solis behind us, uh, which is an adapted version uh, of that iconic splash page. And it's become quite an eye magnet uh, for visitors and photographers here in the gallery, the screaming surfer image. Uh, in fact, it's an image that seems to represent fury or just raw, you know, distilled rage, and yet people seem to love posing in front of it. Uh, they seem to be charmed by it, <laughs> despite the, uh, the, that, that sense of boiling anger that really comes up, at least for me, uh, in the image. And so we have the two murals in this main space, uh, catty corner to each other, that act as uh, 
again, eye magnets. Part of the challenge here was to take the intimate hand-sized form of the 8x10 or 7x10 vintage comic book and create uh, both a space that's fun to navigate for gallery visitors and a little bit of spectacle to add color uh, and to add, again, these magnetic images, these large images. Uh, Kirby's work holds up remarkably well, uh, even at enormously magnified size. Of course it does. Uh, and to put some of these images that were originally drawn at 11 by 17, say, or 16 by 20 inches, and to make them 8 by 12 feet, for example, uh, was one of the things that we enjoyed doing, one of the things we enjoyed trying. Right? Again, most of the artwork in the show is comic book production artwork, but there are examples like the uh, wonderful Dream Machine painting that Kirby did in 1975 that represent aspects of his uh, own private artistic practice apart from the breakneck scheduling of comic book production. We're very fortunate to have this here, uh, and we've known all along that this had to be on a wall by itself. In fact, this is the first piece of art that was hung in this gallery uh, when the show was being assembled here in the summertime, uh, was the um, Dream Machine painting, a wonderful, wonderfully graphic piece of abstract Kirby tech. Over here, along this wall is a capsule biography of Jack Kirby to introduce him and his work uh, to unaccustomed uh, visitors uh, and examples uh, of things from the first half, roughly, of Kirby's career in comics. Um, also things representing his childhood, his upbringing. We have the 1983 Street Code story, uh, which was among the last complete comic book stories that Jack Kirby made. He made it in his um, late mid-60s, but really about his experience on the streets of New York in the 1920s. And then moving uh, toward the yellow square, we have vintage examples of Kirby's early art, our earliest piece of Boyd Commando's page from 1943, uh, representing that uh, sort of pre-war era of uh, pre-war for, for Kirby prior to Jack Kirby's military experience. Uh, and then we move chronologically into the 50s with um, other examples of work with partner Joe Simon from the classic Simon and Kirby period. Uh, a Black Magic cover uh, among the few pieces in the gallery um, that is actually inked by Kirby himself and seems to bear his distinctive um, uh, inking style. Beneath Black Magic, one of the self-published projects from Simon and Kirby's brief mainline period of uh, the mainline company uh, this is from In Love, uh, number one, a uh, romance title uh, by Simon and Kirby. We've tried to represent uh, elsewhere in the gallery um, the, the phenomenal success uh, of the romance genre, something that is not much sampled in this show because we're dealing with later Kirby, but we've tried to uh, acknowledge that and show what an important and lucrative genre it was for Simon and Kirby for the field. Um, a Rawhide Kid Page from 1963, a beautiful example of twice-up artwork inked and lettered by Dick Ayers. Um, this page is so clean and so elegant. Uh, it's something that's really drawn the uh, attention of, of a lot of viewers. Uh, and of course, a classic Wally Wood inked Sky Masters of the Space Force Sunday page from the late 1950s. To give people a sense of what's happening in Jack Kirby's creative life prior to 1960, we tried to bring all of these um, elements in. Right? Whereas the main gallery includes a diverse sampling of art um, by Jack Kirby from the Fantastic World to the Fourth World to his trademark collages to early work representing the historic Simon and Kirby period, the two rear galleries that we're about to enter um, uh, are themed differently. For example, in this gallery right behind me we have a single comic book story, a comic book issue, um, which is an issue of Commandy, The Last Boy on Earth, a personal favorite of mine uh, from, well, let's just say that the inner 10-year-old here is kind of uh, jumping up and down. <laughs> uh, this room makes me feel as if I'm on a trampoline. This is issue number 14 of Commandy, The Last Boy on Earth, uh, which is from uh, 1973, I think, early 1973. Um, and this story, the, the climax of a four-part sequence in Commandy um, featuring 
well, Commandy's forced to run the equivalent of a horse race on Grasshopper back uh, in this issue. Um, uh, and as outlandish as that premise is, it, you know, typically outlandish for uh, Commandy, the last boy on Earth, it's also a comic filled with poignancy, um, with consequential violence, not just fisticuffs, but things that really uh, affect, uh, affected me personally as a reader. Um, uh, poignancy, mercy killing, uh, grievance, loss, all these things are built into this 20 page story. We're fortunate to have uh, both the cover and the 20 interior boards that comprise this entire uh, comic book issue. What we have done here is display in clockwise fashion uh, all the boards in sequence, hoping that at least some visitors will read most or all of the story uh, while they're in this space. Also, courtesy of the Kirby Museum, we've been able to display some giclées of photocopies of Kirby's pencil art uh, from his home thermal fax machine uh, that one can compare to the finished pages uh, embellished by Mike Royer. So we've taken the opportunity to put three of those pencil facsimiles or recreations on the walls above the inked pages that they represent so that people can have a sense of process. In addition, with the uh, help of the Kirby Museum, uh, we have this interactive iPad display, a tablet display, an iBook uh, called um, Pencils to Inks that allows visitors to look at all of the pages uh, from this comic uh, in their uh, pencil form and to swipe back and forth, literally to swipe back and forth on the screen between pencil and ink versions so that you can make uh, pencils fade into inks or inks fade back into pencils. And this way people can really see the fidelity of uh, inker and letterer Mike Royer's work and they can have a sense of the production process behind this particular comic book. This was an early part of the vision for this exhibit um, that we've always remained sort of steadfastly on target. We always wanted to have a complete issue of Commandy in this gallery and we always wanted to have some representation of the, the, the archaeology of the book, the production process um, behind the book. So to have a story that's poignant and action-filled um, and startling, uh, and at the same time to have uh, some survivals of the process of how it got made in an interactive way for people to engage it in greater depth, um, we feel very lucky to have that. I've spoken to a number of people who are not inveterate comic book fans like me, who had never heard of Commandy the Last Boy on Earth, who were really startled uh, by this story in this gallery, uh, and both how strange and how moving uh, it is. Uh, I'm glad to be able to display that. We have a few copies of the published comic book on view. Um, uh, I would like to have put even more copies on view, um, but we try to make sure that at least a couple of spreads in the published comic, the, the, the offset, you know, or the, the, the four color version, the pulpy four color version, uh, rather, were represented here. So uh, we have um, pencils, we have the actual ink boards used in the production of the comic, and we have examples of the final printed version uh, of the book. Moving on in this direction toward our deepest gallery, or furthest back gallery, we have a number of themes here, but the first thing to note is we have another complete comic book story. Uh, this one from about five years earlier, this is Thor number 155, uh, published by Marvel in 1968, uh, largely inked by Vince Coletta, uh, and we have those pages stacked in twos going from the white wall to the red so that the entire 20-page uh, story uh, can, be, can be read. Uh, and one of the motives for using this particular issue is how well it represents both the mythological and the science fiction elements uh, of Thor at this period. To me, this is quintessential Jack Kirby. The fact that this story goes from Ego the Living Planet, uh, the robot-like recorder, um, the colonizers of Rigel uh, to more uh, mythological or even Shakespearean and Three Musketeers <laughs> uh, like imagery um, uh, from the dashing warriors uh, with, with mace and sword uh, to the flying cosmic beings in Kirby's fizzy version of outer space. Um, all kinds of things are combined here and that kind of uh, profligate blending of different genres is something that Thor represents very, very well. Um, and we wanted to make sure we had this here so that viewers who had paid close attention to the fourth world in the front gallery would see 
uh, how the fourth world is a kind of notional sequel to the work in Thor, old gods to new gods. And we wanted to make sure that the two galleries had some kind of dialogue going on uh, in that respect. So again, this is Thor 155, uh, a prime example of Kirby's myth fantasy in a late 60s Marvel mode. We've used thematic clusters here in the remaining walls in this gallery to represent certain preoccupations uh, of Jack Kirby. Uh, so we call this cluster Future Primitive, which represents both uh, Kirby's kind of visions of prehistory of primitive humankind and also uh, the clash of the primitive and the high tech, uh, something that is well represented uh, in stories like Toxel the World Killer, uh, and then again a number of years later in uh, Devil Dinosaur, where the titular dinosaur and his friend Moon Boy, the first human, encounter naturally robotic extra extraterrestrials who kidnap and corral all the dinosaurs. Uh, these images have really struck a lot of visitors to the gallery, uh, as has, of course, this uh, often reprinted image from Devil Dinosaur number four, uh, a titanic piece of art by Kirby. We have the colored printed version of this uh, nearby, we've tried to set up things in a nearby case so that we have a sight line that leads directly from published comic book uh, to the outsized original. We're also fortunate to have this unpublished or unused pencil page from the Devil Dinosaur series. One of a handful of pencil pieces uh, touched only by Kirby um, that we were able to show here, which we think is very important in terms of educating the public. Um, again, about Kirby's process as well as the role of inkers in completing that process, but also the, the raw uh, kind of handiwork qualities of Kirby's own art before anyone else has embellished it. From Future Primitive, we go to the world that's coming, representing projects like, again, Commandy, the last boy on Earth, as well as OMAC, Kirby's early mid-70s dystopian future take on the Captain America premise, uh, a kind of chilly future world uh, represented here. Um, I think one of the, the beautiful things about uh, displaying Kirby art is that uh, people can glom onto or pursue these themes, these suggested themes that, that uh, uh, I've written brief blurbs about in the gallery, or they can simply look at the images and, and, and wow at their kind of violent energy, which we see uh, so well displayed here. So some of these pieces were chosen for energy, some were chosen for poignancy, uh, some were chosen for spectacle, but we tried to make sure that, uh, in particular, prime 1970s work by uh, Jack was represented along this wall. Uh, here we have a wall that's themed around the idea of gods and demigods and demons, uh, including two uh, gicles representing the Lord of Light project commissioned by Barry Geller in 1978, um, where you can see really the apotheosis of Kirby's kind of archaic slash futuristic or, or mythic slash science fiction mode. Uh, beautiful pieces of artwork from that uh, project. Uh, between those two, we put a spread from The Eternals, uh, a series that I wanted to make sure was represented. I would have liked it to have been uh, even more heavily represented in the show. But between the two Lord of Lights, we wanted The Eternals uh, to be there. Uh, we have this extraordinarily, um, well, it's an extraordinary abstract piece um, this is a light boxed ink version, uh, ink by Angel Gabriele, of a 1966 pencil piece um, created by Kirby as a gift for fellow artist Don Heck. And it's sort of stuck with the name Futuristic Cityscape. Um, uh, we can certainly see that in the image. We can see quite a bit else in the image also. Um, this is perhaps oddly next to pages from The Demon, uh, Kirby's uh, sort of folkloric and um, old monster movie like. A hybrid of, of superheroics and, and horror. Um, we're also proud to have in the same vicinity a page from the very late project by Jack, uh, Silver Star. This almost uh, genocidal turn in this story where the, the angel of death comes stalking into the city uh, has always been to me a terrifying and very impressive image and idea and we wanted to have that. I had a conversation here yesterday with one of our uh, uh, Arts Council members at CISA, one of our volunteers, who was not familiar with this work at all, and she said, he is very drawn to the dark side, yes? Um, which is funny, because then we talked about how uplifting and poignant some of this art is as well. Um, but it is interesting that you know, he came away seeing uh, the kind of darkness. 
Uh, and I know that some uh, Kirby fans and scholars think of Jack as an optimist. Others may think of him as a pessimist. I think there's evidence for both of those points of view actually <laughs> uh, in this show. Yeah. Over here we tried to contrast some 1960s and 70s examples from Captain America series uh, with a Frank Jacoya uh, 1967 page uh, representing Cap uh, in a battle with Batroc, one of his foes, and then again a Cap page from 10 years later inked by Mike Royer uh, in, a, in a very different style uh, so that we would have the ability once again to call out the inkers, their names and their respective styles and ask people to think about um, what's going on in the process. We also note here that we've got twice up artwork versus 150% or one and a half up artwork um, and we try to make note of that so that people who really want to read these blurbs and labels carefully can come away with an added um, understanding of what's happening in comic book history both before and after 1968. Um, this image also from Captain America does not have cap in it but it's such an extraordinary example of graphic patterning, such a mesmerizing page. Uh, again, from the late 70s cap inked by Mike Royer, we wanted to put that here as well. So it would have this cluster that it would at least represent um, the star-spangled hero, but would also show off a contrast of art styles and, and different phases of Kirby. So. Once again, out here in the main gallery, uh, we have several um, uh, different clusters uh, and different features of the show that we want to call attention to. We not only have another interactive iPad display that shows three eras of Kirby, again provided by the Kirby Museum, but we also have this case representing um, work from the 1940s to the 1960s. Right? We were fortunate uh, to work with a number of lenders uh, that brought us some wonderful vintage Simon and Kirby era comic books as well as uh, a couple of relevant pieces of original art. Uh, we have pages here from Foxhole, the mainline comic published by Simon and Kirby in 1954. Uh, we have a sampling of 1940s comics coming from the Simon and Kirby studio. We have a copy of the very first romance comic ever, 1947's Young Romance Number no. 1, that comic that set off a firestorm, an industry-dominating trend, um, making romance you know, one quarter of the whole comic book market by the end of the 40s, uh, the, 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 the very successful genre um, that really changed the lives of uh, Jack Kirby and his partner Joe Simon. We have one of our earliest pieces here, which is Stuntman, a Stuntman page uh, from the Harvey Comics title, 1946. Uh, and we have a few vintage photos uh, representing uh, Jack and, and one of Jack and Joe Simon together at work, representing that period. Uh, this case also gets, maybe too quickly, uh, into early 1960s um, uh, Marvel work, um, kind of fitting with the theme of our show that we're dealing with the, um, the mid-60s forward particularly. We tried to use this case as a sort of scene setting, all too brief overview of the extraordinary uh, uh, fertility or productivity of uh, Jack Kirby's first 20 plus years in the comic book business. We wanted to make sure that we had some westerns, that we had some uh, horror and suspense titles, that we had some war titles, that we had a Marvel monster comic uh, from that very early 60s period. Uh, and we put all that together to be, as it were, a kind of prelude to uh, the rest of the show that picks up Jack's work um, uh, from the mid-60s onward. So we call this the 40s to 60s case, um, and uh, we've already seen the, the 60s to 80s case, um, and having standing cases of uh, mostly published comic books we felt was important to go along with the original art. What we've been trying to do is stress uh, the readability of this art, there is a tendency to pay a different kind of attention when it's on a gallery wall, to think of it less as reading matter uh, and to look at it as we might look at, at paintings or other monumental works of art. I don't think we can help that. There's a tendency for us to change our mindset. But we've tried to straddle the gallery feeling and the, and the readability um, in, in the gallery. Uh, and that is something that I've thought about almost from the very first. As an English professor who likes to encourage reading, uh, that's always been important to me. That's one of the things underlying the decision to have two complete stories uh, in the show as well. Uh, and it also underlies just the desire to get these uh, publications here uh, in the cases so that people will see them 
Uh, and I do think visitors have made a lot of mental connections between the published form and the art by having these things close by. Plus, these are incredibly evocative objects, even under glass. Uh, to see old comic books, 10 cent, 12 cent, 15 cent comic books, uh, aspects of American culture, vivid pieces of graphic art, the covers are striking in their own right. Uh, those are very evocative and they seem to call out even to people who are not comic book fans when they come into the show. Uh, and that, so that's been um, an important part of the exhibit as well. Overall, this has been a labor of love, a dream come true, uh, the usual um, sort of feisty hand clasp between 50 year old me and 10 year old me. It's been all of those things uh, to be able to do um, our country's uh, we believe largest solo exhibition of Jack Kirby to date. To do it on a university campus, all my classes are coming in here, making that happen, making use of it um, uh, in a sense that it can educate many of the, of the students on campus and people in our community. That's always been part of the mission as well. Um, that we have such a wonderful gallery program and our gallery director, Jim Sweeters, really knows how to help display this work to advantage, uh, has really been a gift uh, to me. So it's my hope that there will be further and larger uh, <laughs> exhibitions of Jack Kirby's work in future. Uh, we know this the idea whose time has come, uh, and we know that this is an artist who uh, reads we very well uh, in the hand in comic book form, but also displays spectacularly to advantage in the gallery space, so... Taru! <laughs>